بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Welcome brothers and sisters to Pillars and Wahda. Do we have any Wahda people here today? MashaAllah. United here at Dar Al Quran, Arlington, Texas. Waiting to listen, inshaAllah, continuation for preparing for death. How to prepare yourself for death. We have some new faces here. I welcome all of you. And we have some old faces, I will come back, all of you. And we have some people who invited others, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. And one of those things to prepare for death is what you do, and inshallah we'll be talking about that. Just want to recap on last week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-A'raf, فَلَنَسْأَلَنَّ الَّذِينَ أُرْسِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَنَسْأَلَنَّ الْمُرْسَلِينَ فَلَنَقُصَّنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ بِعِلْمٍ وَمَا كُنَّا غَائِبِينَ وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ الْحَقِّ Scary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say surely Definitely, we're going to be questioning not only the people that we send messengers to, but also the messengers themselves. You know, when it gets to questioning the prophets, you're not off the hook in any way. Even Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, here's the scary part, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked his people, how long did he call? 950 years. Picture yourself 950 years going from house to house, from door to door, from people to people, from meeting to meeting, facing people 950 years, day and night at all times. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, has he delivered the message? Guess what the answer is? Unanimously no. All people deny 950 years of calling. And guess who will support him? Yes, us. How do we know? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu told us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. So my point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, surely I'm going to question you. Question you about what? About what? About the purpose of your existence. Why did you come here? Oh, Allah brought me here. But what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He said, I created you to worship. Did you worship? I did my best. <coughs> wow. Imagine yourself, you're hired for a job and you are sent to fulfill a task and you don't do anything. And then when they ask, you said, I did my best. What a wonderful person. You haven't done, you haven't even tried. <coughs> you haven't learned, you haven't searched and you did your best. That's a lie. So this is scary. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question you. And we said four things that you have to remember all the time that you created to worship. What do you understand from that? It comes first. Anytime you have a clash between salah and work or school, which one you do first? Obviously the one you sent for. If I hired you to vacuum the room, 
and then you come and you see the desk messed up. Which one you fix first? You vacuum or you fix the desk? Naturally, what you are sent for, the vacuum. If you did not fix the desk, it's okay. You're not hired for that. You're not hired for that. You're hired for the ground. So you're created for worship. If you made the worship and you died, you did not go to school, you did not finish the test, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to tell you, why don't you do it? Because you did the job that you're for. This is something that you have to really settle it in your head because everyone, when you ask him, why you created, oh, we created here to worship. Why don't you worship it? I do my best. You do your best and your best is not doing it. But you're doing everything else which is not your best, supposedly. And you're doing it. When you go to play, do you do your best? I mean, you plan for this and you don't plan for that. So this is number one. The second one is how to prepare for death. Then definitely know that you're going to die. You know, it's the sad part, funny part, you could say. How many of you want to go to Jannah? You want to die? See? How can you go to Jannah without dying? Most people don't like to die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the people of the book, when they claim that Jannah is for them, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Didn't wish for death. Because death is the only way that you can go to Jannah. You have to die and go to Jannah. If you guarantee in Jannah, why don't you die? Why don't you wish for death? Go ahead and make dua, Allah, make me die now. That means either you're not doing what you're supposed to do, or you don't believe in it. One of the two. So know that you're going to die. And know for sure that if you die, it's not over. So when we say here, what do we say? He's rested. Uh, probably you need to bring some cup of coffee and tea and put some th something in the grave just like the Pharaoh used to do. Because he's resting, he's kicking back. When he's dying, he's just having fun time. Uh, prepare that food for him and everything. How many people died and came back and told you it was fun to be in the grave? We just rested there. What a miserable day here, go working nine to five or eight to four, and your parents on your tail and the school and everything, just die and go rest over there. Or in Arabic, when you say, to his final destiny. Really? You mean you're gonna die and not come back? Hmm, how many of you know the surah, al hakam al takaf don't tell me you don't know it, brother. Hmm? al hakam al takafa Hatta Zurtum. What is the meaning of Zurtum? Visited. So the graveyard is a visit. Have you seen anybody visited you and lasted forever? I mean, we're not talking about leeches. You know, there are some people when they do something, they don't. Visit has to end. So you visit the grave, you've ended it. That's a proof you're coming back. So there is a day of judgment. So now that you're going to be resurrected, know that you're going to be a question. We talked about that. We said, why do you want to prepare yourself for death? That question, uh, that question is easily answered because death comes with a text message. So, you receive a text message, tomorrow you can die. Angel Jibreel communicate with you? No. Anyone tells you when you're gonna die? No. Then, it might be now. Are you ready? That's the question. So, death comes out of a sudden, then I need to prepare for it now, before it comes. So that's one reason. 
Allah subhanahu ve teala told me wal tanzur nefsun ma kaddemet li gad O you who believe check and see what have you advanced for your future home Yani what did you do for the day of judgment what did you do for the house that you want in jannah are you prepared for it did you work for it that's a question so because of that i am preparing for death another one is all the messengers came with a message telling me to prepare and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told me prepare yourself before sickness that makes you unable to work before poverty that makes you so busy in earning money and not worshiping or before richness that makes you so busy in partying and spending your money or death so that's why you prepare how do you prepare we said number one remembering death i mean how can you prepare for something if you don't remember if if you have to prepare for work and you don't remember your work in tomorrow how can you prepare for it? you can't so remember that and that's why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said aktiru min dhikri hadi min that don't just remember it remember it a lot any time you remember that you feel good true or false True. True. So you feel good when you remember that? Why you feel good? Um, if you're like on time with your prayers and everything, it makes you feel good. You're looking forward to that time. Okay, but aren't you scared that you go to hell? So why? You get to meet Allah so. Sheikh, the, the, the whole title is how to prepare for death. So if I am prepared for death, remembering it makes me prepare. Preparing for it is obedience. Obedience is connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever seen anyone connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miserable? Have you ever seen someone connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala scared? You never do that. It never happens. So remembering death makes me work. Work gets me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes me feel good. That's why they say al mu'min kul awqatu raha all of the time the believers are fun time. When you have when you are rested you worship and that's fun time because when you worship you relax worship makes you relax when you relax worship and worship makes you relax so all of your time relax and they say إذا أردت الراحة فترك الراحة. If you want to rest, don't rest. You got that right? Because a lot of people here they say one life to live. Yeah, and then hell. <laughs> Because that's that's really what it means. One life to live. It's like let's have fun all of our life and then go to hell. That's exactly what it means. If you look at it this way, but if I look at it, one life to live, then I work so hard. I'm not rested at all. I end up permanently rested. In Jannah, it's all rewards. There's no work there. So that is a reason. So remembering death, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called the person or named the person intelligent. He said, "Man dana nafsa wa amila lima ba'd al maut." If you accuse yourself, where is the brother who said he hasn't done any mistakes? Is that your brother or your friend? What is he? Is that him? You, brother? No, it's not you. 
You look different than you sitting over there. He said, what did you say? Come on, it's okay. I mean, we're, we're benefiting from it. When you make mistake or I make mistake, we all learn from it and benefit. Look here. The intelligent person is the one who accuses himself being not complete, not good, had shortcomings, not doing what he's supposed to do. Yani, if you fast Ramadan and you fast Mondays and Thursdays and you pray and you do Qiyam and you pray the Sunnah and you donate and you give and if somebody will tell you, uh, you ready to die? Then, oh, brother, you know, I don't know, no, maybe maybe I get, I get more work, inshallah. Oh, brother, you're doing this. Oh, no, 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 that's nothing, brother. That's, that's nothing compared to what I... That's, that's reality of the, of the believer. You never feel you have done enough because every time you think you realize that you have ni'am, you have blessings, unbelievably too much, too much. Yani look, he scratched his face. Can you imagine if you can't scratch your face? You don't think about that. Oh, what's the big deal? He scratched his face. Tai, picture yourself somebody holding your hand, and you cannot do that. It is the least that you could think of the ni'am. It is huge if you lose it. The only time you realize is when you don't have it. You wish for anything else. So, you have so much ni'am, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves more. What's the second thing? So remembering death, visiting the grave. Did you ever visit a grave? Not those graves that has the birthday party and flowers and you feel like you're going for a party a lot more than going to a graveyard. You go to a graveyard back home, it's so spooky and you would be saying, Mama, Wallah Sheikh, there was a graveyard and a road. No one dares to pass by that road after Isha. Because a graveyard is a graveyard there. It's not like here you have the lead, you have the light, probably have some perfume and everything, and it feels like, wow, it's, you know, it's like you want to die, and you just go there and join the party. <laughs> no, but, no, but there it's, that, that's why in, in Islam you don't build the grave, and you don't raise it, and you don't write on it, you don't, you just make it look like a grave. It's not like a castle. People are not living there. So going to the graveyard, uh, I don't know, one, one person made a, a video half an hour under the ground, dug a grave in the graveyard, not in your backyard, in the graveyard and you go lay in it and see how that feels. Now from looking from above, it looks normal. You go down and lay down on it and look up and just picture it. Something is going to be on top of you, you cannot see. Have you had an MRI, any of you? A 1980 MRI, not this one here that uh, looks like an open tunnel from both sides. That one, you go from here to there, dead end, and you stop there. And it's like, it seems like forever when it's sliding, going inside. And this wall is right there. And when you talk, the sound bounces back in your face. I mean, you don't want to even talk. So you want to yell, but yelling bothers you a lot more than getting help. And you, you just panic. A lot of people cannot handle that. You're alive and you have somebody talking to you. And with a push of a button, they get you out. The help is there. You're safe. You're not worried about anything. And yet you cannot take it. How are you going to take it in the grave? So when you go to the graveyard and reflect on those people, what do you think they wish? Their number one wish is to come back and pray to Raka. Just to pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And when one of the righteous pedestrians asked the people what did they wish, and they told him, oh, he wished to come back and pray to Raka. So he said, you're alive, don't wish. Say Allahu Akbar, go pray. So we're not here to just talk and hear. Take it, apply it, and prepare for it, and that is the right thing to do. We said also, increase yourself with good things, with taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, provide for yourself, the best that you can have is have taqwa. You're leaving your house. What's the best thing you take with you? It's not your iPhone. It's not a bottle of water. It is the consciousness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. He knows where you're going. He knows what you're planning. He knows what you're going to do. So remember, He can take you and he can reward you. So both of them should make you conscious of him. I stay away from the haram and I do the good and I expect the reward. Your travel from home to here is a huge preparation for death. Because increasing yourself with knowledge, without this knowledge, you cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot know, you don't know how to pray. You don't know how to fast. You don't know how to prepare for death. You don't know what you should do or how to love and how to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowledge is what gets you. If you want to be a farmer, then you go study. Oh, when am I going to sow the seeds and dig the land and harvest? Oh, this uh, 70 days the, uh, starts fruiting. And then uh, in two weeks you can harvest. And then after that it lasts for a, a month or two. Then after that you can cut it and repeat. You study all of that, but when you come here as a human being, why don't you know the average life of the human being? When are you going to be accounted for goods and for bad? When is the peak of your time? What is the most rewarding time of your time? What is the most rewarding time, Shaykh, of your life? Period. <coughs> yani if you were if you were to say, say Alhamdulillah. Zahmi. That's Sheikh, I have to hear it. Ya Rahamuk Allah. There's a joke on that. I'll leave it to the, to the end, inshallah, if we have time. So, preparing for this and having the taqwa, inshallah, is going to make you prepare for death. Because if you have taqwa and you have consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means you have hasanat and that means you are in good terms. I want to go to death, I mean to grave. I want the grave to be spacious. How do you want your grave? Your size? Spacious. How spacious? I want my grave to be as far as I can see. How about you? It's from here to forward? Farther? Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the believer his grave will be so spacious and you would have a window to Jannah. So you see your place in Jannah from the grave. It's like you want the day of judgment to start, but it's not time for it. So I want a spacious grave because you either have a squished grave that dislocates your bones or a spacious grave that is going to be so spacious and so good. Tayyip. Quran. This is how you prepare for death. Not just reading Quran, reflecting on Quran. When you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, don't come and tell me, oh, it means thank you, Allah. Yani, wow, it touched your heart. It makes you shiver. Right? But when you close your eyes and you say, Alhamdulillah, and a movie passes by of all the ni'am, I see, I hear, I walk, family, job, health, ah, you feel good. 
Now you really know what you're thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. I'm doing good to Allah, but I do bad sometimes. But you are the most merciful. That's what I love about you. You forgive me when I make mistakes, but I don't do it on purpose. And it's not like I'm not doing good, I'm working on good, but sometimes I slip. You are a Rahman a Rahim. Maliki Yawmuddin, and you go. So you reflect on the Quran. A lot of people, they read or they memorize, but they don't try to understand. I'm not saying that when you read the Quran, when you memorize the Quran, I want you to be a alim or I want you to dig deep into understanding. No, at least know what you're talking about. That way, when you say Subhana Rabbi Al A'la, when you are on the ground, why did you say Al A'la, not Al Azim? Because you are too low. You cannot get lower than putting your head on the ground. And you are this low for the one who is so high. That is absolute humbleness. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you and that's how you elevate yourself high. The more humble you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more elevated in dunya. Those arrogant people who will be humiliated in life and after life. You know the day of judgment, arrogant people, what they get? There will be the size of the ant, the Prophet sallallahu said. The smallest kind of ant and people will be trampling, walking all over them. Because they were yani, uh, bloating themselves for something, it's not theirs. If I want to brag about my accomplishment, then I have to be the creator of my ability. I have to be the one who gave himself the strength. This strength that I have, this vision that I have, this brain that I have, did I have it on my own or someone gave it to me? Someone gave it to me. So how can I brag about something that is not mine? Yeah, that's in practical life. I see people doing that left and right. How many of you brag about their car and they don't own it? I checked my car, did you see it? You know, yeah, I just bought it, man. So if I want to ruin his life, they were sitting said, brother, what do you own in it? How much you own? Car love? You, you, you haven't, you, you don't own the car. How can you brag about something it is not yours? Wallah, it's not yours. So, like some people go, oh, you know, Islamic financing is like bank, no difference. And why do you have to deal with either one? Why don't you buy the thing that you can afford? If you can't afford it, you don't need it. Why don't you train yourself and teach yourself to do that? 90% of your parents here did that. They never involved in riba and they never had what they wish for unless they have the money for it. Raise your hand if your father was otherwise. How? Why? But here you are so spoiled on luxury, so spoiled that everything you wanted with the push of a button. If I like this, I want it. You sound like a, a, a kid in a candy store. Every piece of candy he wants it and everything. If everything you desire, you have. What kind of a life is this? Leave something. Leave something for yourself. To, I mean, it's like you're worshiping your body. You're worshiping your desires. Everything I desire something, I want to go get it. Even if I get it in haram, even if it takes me to hell, I take it. Sheikh, brothers, the, the most rewarding thing that the Prophet, or one of the most rewarding things that the Prophet ﷺ said, is if you help someone pay his debt, 
because debt breaks the back of the person, the real one. But nowadays, we look for debt. You apply for credit card to put yourself in debt. You buy to put yourself in debt. Uh, you know, guess what? If I spend a hundred thousand dollars, they give me a thousand back. Yeah, dad, that's why I bought a car. Because, uh, well, look, well, they gave me a thousand dollars back. I only know 99 now. <laughs> and, uh, sometimes, sometimes people don't get it. You know, I, I think people who advertise things and people who are salesmen are so intelligent. The way we do things, especially with those family deals. You go buy a family deal and you're only one. <laughs> Why? Because you say. And then you eat part of it and the rest of it rots and you throw it in the trash and you continue to buy family deals. Try to make sense to those people. No, yes, and buy the real one because that's all you need. The rest of it you're going to throw it away. And when someone puts something, yeah. if something on sale and you don't need it, why you go buy it? Because it's on sale, right? But you don't need it. You make yourself need it. Because you either have no brain or you're just too spoiled. You know you can't afford buying too many things. So you starve yourself to death and then you decide to go shopping. Everything in the store looks good. From the beginning of the store to the end of the store, you're collecting. That was good. That's not bad. Yeah, I'm going to try that. Yeah, that's good. You end up with two, three hundred dollars, and all you need is going for ten, twenty dollars. Why? Because you went there hungry. Type so eat and stuff your face and go. You'll be running so fast. And I don't need this. You come back and you probably buy a gallon of milk, and that's hoping that you drink it because you're not hungry. So some people don't, and preparing for death is similar. When you prepare for death, you just want to be realistic about how to prepare for death. It's not don't do anything good or live in misery or cry all the time or get scared or no. I live my life, but I am conscious of what I'm doing and I'm conscious of the right and the wrong. Another thing you prepare for your death, husnuban billah. Always think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala good, especially at time of death. Yani at time of death, one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum was dying. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this young man, he was dying. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered. He told him, how are you? How do you find yourself? He said, Arju Allah, Ya Rasulallah, wa akhafu dhunubi. I am optimistic to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time, I'm worried and scared of my sins. Look how he puts it. It's not I'm scared of my sins, oh my God. It's not, oh, alhamdulillah, I'm going to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, I'm going to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is good. But I am worried about my sins. This is not too optimistic for me. So look what the Prophet ﷺ said. لا يستمعان في قلب عبد مؤمن في مثل هذا الموطن إلا أعطاه الله ما يرجو وأمنه مما يخاف. Any time you have hope in Allah subhanahu wa taala at time of death and worry about your sins, but Allah subhanahu wa taala grants you the hopeful thing and protect you from the things that you worry from. Always you want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinking of Him as merciful, forgiving. Never think of Him, oh my God, I'm going to die, He's going to put me in hell, that's it, this is my end. Don't think this way. If you are pulled over by a policeman, what would you say? How would you make him maybe save you from the ticket. You say, officer, I'm so sorry. Uh, you are a kind person. I really appreciate your service and 
you are the one who protect us and take care of us and everything and I, I know I should be better than this. Or you would say, oh, you are the one who go after people and lock people in jail and you will give us tickets, you have no mercy, you don't. And you expect him to let you go. So this is just in a human being, you would not do that. How about stop for Allah when you deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to be so hopeful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thinking good. Repentance, repentance, repentance. How many times you should repent? How many times? All the time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Every time you sin, you should repent immediately. And you should repent even without sinning. And you should repent after you do good. Look what we do. You pray and you say, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum. What's the first thing you say? Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. You did the best prayer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and you say, Astaghfirullah. Because you don't know exactly how well you did it. How close to that sunnah you did it. If it's accepted or not, so you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you for your shortcomings. So another preparation is fulfilling the obligation and staying away from major sins. Salah, that, 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 you, that should be out of the question. Yani whether you are healthy or poor or sick or mad or happy, as long as you breathe and your eyes blink, you have to pray. Even with your eyes. That's all you have and you probably wonder. A person that I know just got paralyzed in a different country, completely back and neck flat on his back, cannot move at all. If you, if, you, if you want to know how sad and how, you ever heard of foundation raising the house, digging foundation to raise a have foundation problem? He was doing that. The house fell on him. It was unreal how they pulled him out from under the house and he's laying down now he doesn't have to pray and you know who he is Mu'evin. he's the one who calls the prayer in masjid and if you want sheikh i'll make you hear his voice too after he got the accident i told him to record it but the, what I'm saying is, even in this situation, he cannot say, I don't have to pray. He has to pray. So imagine yourself when you are healthy and you miss the prayer, and it is more sinful than doing a major sin. It's more sinful than zina. It's more sinful than alcohol. It's more sinful than any of those major sins because you are created for it. You're not created to stay away from alcohol. You're created to worship and part of the worship is to stay for, away from the alcohol. But you are here to pray, to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And people don't do it. Stay away from major sins. One of those major sins, not yadi, Backbiting is a major sin, but worse than that is slander. Is when you accuse someone in his or in her honor. You accuse someone who's in zina. And at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when one of the hypocrites slandered Aisha radiallahu anha with zina, one of the companions he did not accuse her, he just said, so and so said 
that Aisha did such and such. He was lashed 80 times. What did he actually do? Did he accuse? No. What did he do? He carried the statement of the slander. He became a slanderer. How many of us now would come and say, did you hear? So and so said that she or he did such and such. You're a slanderer, just like the person who said it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the community to always be clean. <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu when he punished a person of committing zina, he said, anyone commits any of this filthy acts, he should not show up himself to us or we're going to establish the penalty on him. Is this like, as long as you don't show it to us, you're okay? No. It means like, if you do it secretly, it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will punish you. But if you publicize it, you're going to ruin a community. Definitely you're going to get the punishment. So no one would dare to do that. And that is why when the person gets the punishment, guess what? Everyone is invited to watch. Yes, to watch that grievous punishment. So you know you're next if you do it. And maybe that's why hardly you hear of any incidents at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And the incidents were reported, guess how? They came and confessed and said they want to be punished. That's how bad they felt from the sin. They wanted to be punished. So staying away from this haram, slandering, backbiting, and your parents. Who wants his parents, brother? I mean, what do you want from your parents? They did nothing for you. So, what kind of question is this? I'm going to live with someone and leave the one who raised me all my life. Let that person I want to live with is an angel. I'm going to disregard the one who brought me to this world. Wow. Is this your way of thank you to your mom and dad? Oof. You cannot say it. And oof is a major sin. Major sin. Not a sin, major sin. Flipping your eyes is a major sin. Shrugging your shoulder is a major sin. Mocking your parents is a major sin. Raises your vo raising your voice over their voice is a major sin. All of those major sins, if you make analogy with, that's a major sin. If your mom keeps calling you, calling you, calling you, and then you say, Okay, yes, mom. Major sin. And then you go for the test and you say, Alhamdulillah, I studied. Well, I had a of him, I don't know, you know, I just went blank. Of course you got to go blank. Because your mom went blank. Don't, any time you have a horrible thing in your life, you know what you do first? Check yourself, what did you do wrong? It is definitely because of that. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ Any musiba, فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ Because you earned it. وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٍ And plenty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let go and did not punish you for it. وَلَوْ يُؤَاخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ بِمَا كَسَبُوا مَا تَرَكَ عَلَيْهَا مِنْ دَابَ if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accounts you for your sins, you'll be finished. So watch out for major sins and make sure you fulfill that. And finally, my friends, hasten to good deeds. If something good you want to do, don't wait for him to start or for her to start. 
you'll be number one to do it. If there is anything that increases you with knowledge that gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do that. Taqwa, righteousness, if you want to compete with someone and lose in this dunya, it's okay. But don't let someone beat you in righteousness. If someone memorizes more Quran than you, beat him. Be the one who memorizes more. Compete in things like that and stay away from bad company. How many of you have bad friends? Brother, you have bad friends, I know. Not a single one? Asha, this is good. How do you know if they're bad or good? Action. You asked them? No, action. Action? How many of you have good friends but they don't pray? <laughs> you call that a friend? It's like a same person, he's raising his... A friend that doesn't pray. How can you not make him pray? Honestly, how hard do you work on him to pray? Probably a lot, right? I don't think so. You'll try it one time, the second time. So brother, just leave me alone, okay? You worry about yourself, brother. Khalas, uh, you know, this is between me and Allah. But you know, sometimes this bad friend, what's going to do? He's going to push you to the edge, and you're going to say something, you're going to get punished, and you get saved. Just like two bad friends, the uh, Prophet ﷺ said, he keeps telling him, be good, be good, and that person got angry, and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send you to supervise me, leave me alone. So the other one got angry, the good one. And he said, I swear by Allah, he's not going to forgive you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made both die. And he came to the righteous one. He told, who are you to say I'm not going to forgive him? I forgave him and rejected your acts. Who made him do that? His bad friend. Habibi. Unless you want to influence the person positively, if you try once, twice, three times, four times, it's not working, it's better for you to hang with someone because you need help. I need help. You need help. You need someone. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fa inna Reminder benefits believers. Your friend is not going to remind you of Salah because he doesn't pray. You who get Salah a lot. So make sure you have good company and make sure you raise and make sure you constantly prepare for death. If the angel of death comes to you and he says, I'm coming to take your soul, tell him I'm ready. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, when the angel came to him and he did what he did, then the second time when he gave to, came to him and he was sure that this is the angel of death, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, put your hand on the back of this ox, whatever hair comes under your hand, that's how many years you will live. Thousands, because the hand of Prophet Musa alayhi salam is probably longer than you, brother. So after that, Prophet Musa alayhi salam told him, and after that what? And after I live those years, he said, then you're gonna die. He said, then do it now. Would I dare to say that? No. Why? Because I'm not fully prepared. Are you prepared? Prepared? No one? Are you willing to change, inshallah? Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Wallahi, if you remember death a lot and act upon that, Wallahi, you will feel good. Tkhayyal halak ya Hamza, ibtil'ab id Ibrahim. Wa'aja waqt salah And you're playing everything and death came to your mind. And I say, wow, how many people died when they are playing? A lot. And then you said, let's pray for him. After you pray, you go play the game and enjoy it. 
because you say Alhamdulillah, I pray. <coughs> Makes you feel good. So remembering death doesn't really go into make you miserable, inshallah. So Alhamdulillah, these are the points that I wanted to share with you about preparing death. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to do the righteous deed. If you have any question, we take some questions about death or anything else. If you don't, you don't. Fadda Shaykh. You see, it's not, uh, it's, it's a glad tiding. It's not yani, the day of judgment, but the Prophet wasallam said, you see your place in Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows who's going to Jannah and who's going to hellfire. When you die, your deeds and actions already cease. So that might be, you still have sins to take care of before you go to Jannah. Yani meaning, just because you saw your seat in Jannah, doesn't mean the day of judgment you're gonna go run straight to it. You're going to be under the sun, and you're going to be questioned, and you're going to receive the book, and you're going to pass over the Sirat, and you might have bad deed more than good deed. You might go to hell, get punished, and eventually go to Jannah. But your final destination, you see it. But the process of getting there, uh, you have to wait until the day of judgment to go through all that. By the way, all of those uh, incidents or uh, yani steps that you have to go through before you go finally to Jannah, inshallah, all of those erase from your sins if you are sin if you have sins and elevate you with good deeds. Every hardship strikes you, it's either erasing sins or elevating with hasana. Yani let's say I don't have any sins and I struck my head against something. I got a hundred hasana for it provided you're patient. But if you cuss and curse and all that, you sinned and you got the punishment. If I have sins, it will be erased. So all that trials of the day of judgment that you have to go through, it erases your sins and elevates you. Fadda ya shaykh. Inti dam al mabsood, shu kasla. Pish dam al tudha. He is constantly smiling, you know, is that good? Does it get on your nerves when someone is smiling all the time? Does it? All the time? Sometimes you get me to get angry. Thank you. Tawadda. <laughs> <laughs> you was mentioning about the most blessed day in the, on the most blessed time in the day. You didn't finish. Say it again. The, most, the time was most benefit and most blessed, most barakah. You was going to tell us, but you didn't finish that. Uh, repeat the whole statement so I can refu review my memory. Ihqiya Zalmi the Baraka style that she said. You said uh, it was before the Salah. It was before Salah. It was on the time that you have the most Baraka or the time that's most blessed and most rewarding for you in the day. In the day of judgment? Or here? Most girls, do you don't remember anything? They say that you don't forget. You have supersonic memory. Do women forget? Yes or no? Who has more memory storage, men or women? You're not married. <laughs> I, the most blessed. I don't think he means by the day. I think he means like what, when is the best time to be really religious. Like for example, in Ramadan, it's good to pray and 
Right. I mean, that's what. But I'm trying to relate. What was I talking about? Because there are so many blessed times and moments to. <laughs> Hamza, say, say something. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I think I know what he's talking about. It was basically he, he said he said something, and then you were going to answer that, but I forgot. <laughs> wow, this is this is this is so good. But I, I, I like your I like your style. You attracted a lot of attention. <laughs> no, no, he, he made it sound so good that we were really we thought well, we had something going. So you said you said to prepare for death means to prepare for death means you commit righteous actions. I'm gonna find it. Can you briefly go over the, what is considered an I'm gonna follow the category or what? Are the requirements for something to be considered Amal Saleh? Amal Saleh, we talked about that so many times, I'm going to say it again, and I'm hoping you register it in your head, brother. Every time you ask the same question. Amal Saleh, righteous deed. It is not considered a righteous deed unless it fulfills two conditions. Number one, it has to be according to the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. Yani it has to be something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his messenger order you to do or encourage you to do. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to give charity. Okay, this is a given. This is according to what the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want. It has the second one, it has to be sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, you are not looking from your act for any personal gain from people. You want the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. Which means, I don't expect you to thank me. I don't expect you to pay me. I'm not going to remind you of it and say I'm the one who saved you and I'm the one who gave you and I'm the one. That is sincere. So this is a righteous deed. <coughs> Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good it is, it is not a righteous deed. What does that mean? You don't get rewards for it. You do get rewards for it, but in dunya only. Yani you give a thousand to show off. Is this gone? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it back to you in dunya. But the day of judgment you say, what is my reward to Allah? I donated. You say, no, you didn't donate. You did it for yourself. I paid you back. Hasanat is conditioned to do it for my sake. You have zero hasanat for that. A person prayed and did not pray according to the sunnah. Yeah, and he was barely touching down the ground and the and half of his back is showing and his pants is lost sometimes and sometimes pull, if he pulls it from the knees it shows from the up and what kind of a prayer is this so at the end of the prayer angels writes zero rewards but did you pray yes but you didn't do it right so i ask you to do a job for me and you go do it, and you don't do it right, I'll pay you for it. Same thing here. So these are the two conditions for a righteous deed. Any righteous deed has to be sincere, has to be according to the sunnah. Steal money and go give it to a poor person. What condition it's missing? You're sincerely giving it. It's not according to the sunnah. Stealing is haram. Is that good enough? Baba. Um, you talked about um, someone slandering Aisha radiallahu on and he was given lashes. That person repeated the statement from the slanderer. What was, his, what was the punishment of the slanderer? The same 80, 80 lashes. 80 lashes, both of them? Yes. Okay, so the same punishment? Yeah, same punishment. So slandering or mentioning the slander to other because you're basically spreading evil in the society 
because when the sin is publicized, it starts to become belittled in the eyes of the sinners. Yani, hala, hala, you're all sitting here. She wants to leave, but she's embarrassed to just get up and walk away while I'm talking. She sits, she gets up and walks. Immediately she walks after me. She, it's like, she can do it, I can do it. That's, that's how we function, and especially when it comes to evil. That is why the publicized sin, the person who does it is at more danger than the person who sins at home. Yani you may smoke cigarette at home or anywhere. People don't see you. You're sinning. But when you go outside and you smoke and give me a light and have a cigarette and all of that, you're basically telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't care about your commands. I do anything I want, anywhere I want. So this is swift punishment for a person who does that. And the bigger the sin, the worse it is. And that's why slandering and uh, accusing people is extremely bad. And this is the you know, most evil thing. Anytime those kind of sins spread in a society, it ruins it. Yani, yani picture, picture the ruling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts for zina, for witnesses actually see it if three said we saw it we say what is the fourth any fourth no fourth turn around 80 lashes for each one of them they actually saw it you have to have four that's it basically you could say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it like impossible to really happen. So this would never be publicized and spread in a society. Unless the person wants to come and confess like it happened at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu That's how evil that is. What was the punishment for uh, the act of zina? Was there a hundred lashes. Look at the slander, almost the same like zina. That's how horrible it is. And the slander is to just say, I saw someone and spread the rumor. Last one, it's all there. The best way to? Uh, the best way to handle disagreements with parents. <laughs> disagreements with parents. To handle disagreement with parents. The best way to handle? Disagreement with parents. Disagreement? Yeah. Uh, listen, uh, submit to them. Oh, what did you say? Submit to them. Follow their opinion. Why, what do you disagree on? Whatever you disagree, I mean, it depends about the disagreement. If you reach, if you argue, you should not argue with your parents anyway. Yeah, if, 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 the, if you want to go somewhere and you ask your mom, mom, I'm going to see my friend, and she goes, no, don't go now. But mom, don't go now. Don't go now. I know it's hard. But if you think convincing her is going to make it worse, you are sinning. You are definitely sinning. You should not anger your mom or your dad in any way. There is nothing that deserves their anger. No man on earth deserves angering mom or refusing the order of mom and dad. Now I know sometimes a person may be uh, yani, the, the parents may be uh, oppressive and stuff like that. And it happens, but there is a way that uh, a judge or someone that you can seek that will yani, check on that and talk to them and make things easier. Or, but me personally, I think it doesn't matter who is he or who she is. It is not even this much worth it. So I'm
anger my mom and my dad and live with their anger. Because everything is written, you're going to get what's written for you regardless. So seek it in the halal way, it will come. Seek it in the pleasurable way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would come and you would feel good and you live your life good. And know for sure, you can never live without your parents. It doesn't matter how old you are, how rich you are. You will come to time that you would wish to get a hug from your dad or from your mom or, or something like that. And no person on earth that you're going to be so, mashallah, happy with and isolate yourself. It's like, you know, as long as she likes me and I like her, you know, we don't care about the world. Yeah. Give it a week or two, you'll be saying, Mama! And you would say. The one person, subhanAllah, the, <coughs> she, was, she was in horrible situation, asking how to save her marriage and everything. And when I asked her, I said, did you speak to your dad? She said, we don't talk. And I said, why you don't talk? She said, because he did not approve the marriage. I said, you're reaping the fruit. Who is she going to go to? When you have a problem, who are you going to go to? Your parents. That's number one you go to. So be careful. Let your parents let yourself be on the wrong, on the right side, and your mom on the wrong side. Obedience to your mom, Allah subhanahu wa taala, will give you what you want in a better way and most obedient. Now. If it. If the argument different perspective, like what perspective? Like Islamic perspective. Islamic perspective. Islamic perspective. Sure. Yeah. يعني أراء أراء مختلفة في الإسلام يعني مذاهب وأشياء ذي. Oh, oh, still, still respect. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَكَ عَلَى أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِهِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطَعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفٌ. Don't obey them. But still be friends with them and be kind with them. Yani you, you would not uh, yell on your mom, you're wrong mom, you don't know, you don't understand, you did not study the sheikhs and so on. Still, she's your mom, be kind with her. Even with a disbeliever and not your mom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you cannot get anywhere, say salam. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he went with his dad over and over and over, and his dad is saying, I'm going to stone you to death. At that point, he realized he's not getting anywhere with his dad. He said, Salaamu Alaikum, Dad. I will still make dua for you. Look how he left. I will still make dua for you. Yani definitely in good terms. When you are with bad people, Salaamu Alaikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When ignorant people deal with them, they say, Salaamu Alaikum. And they leave. That means, I'm not going to harm you. And I'm not going to harm myself because of you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Salaamu Alaikum. Your mom is more deserving of that than anyone else. Taib. <laughs> Raise your hand without a smile, you know. Smiling? Hold him a smile, bro. <laughs> okay. Tafsir, Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad. What's the hikmah behind Allah using Huwa? <laughs> that, should, that question should be from here, not from there. I just, because someone asked me, I, could, I didn't know the answer for it, so... What's the hikmah? This is a revelation. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself with. He did not tell me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm answering you. He did not tell me. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qul huwa, I say, Qul huwa. What's the hikmah? Quraysh asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, describe your God. Describe Allah for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, tell them, that I am the one and the only one. 
why does he have to tell them, tell them Allah is one? He doesn't have to say Qul, because he's speaking directly to them. He would say Allah is one. But he said, Qul hu Allah wa You ittabi' ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Ittabi'u ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Follow the command as is. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to it. And if you want to talk about the masculine and the feminine and all that, no, no, but I'm just telling you, in, this is commonly known in the, in, 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 in the language, the Arabic language, when you use the, those things, it has its implications, but this is not the place for it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kul huwa Allahu ahad, I say, Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Fine, Jazakumullah khair, and the pizza is warmed up. Yeah, we can have the sisters, inshallah, to the other side. There's board games and stuff for them there, and we'll stay here, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. sisters on that side. And, yeah. and again, welcome uh, for sisters from Wahda, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be you united with pillars, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair for coming.